Well, Lyndon Johnson, uh, they didn't let him talk for the first six months. It took him six months to learn how to say Negro, Negro. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, let's hear it one more time, Linda, now. Okay. All right, let him, let him pose again, okay. Okay. Negro, oh, now. Can you say, look, is it say, say it quick, Negro. Okay. Nigger, oh, oh, or oh, nigger, oh. I can't help it, I can't say it, that's all. I can't say nigger, I, I can't, what the hell, nigger, 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 nigger. Let me show my scar, no, 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 no. Just say it and say it and that's it, yeah. He's, yeah, he's, he's con completely confused. Well, there really, that, that, that family is so, phew, it's really, uh, you know, there's is, this is, this is a certain kind of non-Jewish look <laughs> that they could pass any test. They are the biggest non-Jews in the world. No question, they walk right through the line, bap, bap. The wife for the white flannel sacks with a zip up the front with a red nail polish, she's beautiful. She's, she looks at home in a trailer park. Yeah. I check me. Uh, yeah. no. There were 1,600 partisans gathered at San Francisco's Fillmore Auditorium on June 25, 1966, to hear what would emerge as the last public testament of Lenny Bruce. His satire of the chief executive's Texas drawl obviously fulfilled their expectations. Throughout a tempestuous decade, he had unflaggingly skewered the church, motherhood, racial prejudice, Victorian attitudes towards sex, the law, and the abundant apathies of American life. No sacred cows eluded his saber. His utterly frank, uninhibited commentary attracted more enemies than friends. The majority of detractors dismissed him as an irritating menace to the status quo. They scolded him for fathering a strain of so-called sick comedians. Those impressed by Bruce's unsettling inquiries regarded him as the most audible voice of dissent in his time. He offended many of his audiences by his consistent public use of vulgarities, which listeners themselves use just as often in private. He became fair game for noble law enforcement officials who dogged him in half a dozen cities with a determination usually reserved for kidnappers and rapists. Lenny Bruce died less than two months after his San Francisco appearance a hypodermic needle embedded in his arm. But not even the silencing of his strident voice can stifle his endowment, the need for protest in contemporary society. Dr. Joel Fort, a lecturer in the sociology department at the University of California, served as a witness for Bruce in one of his numerous days in court. Uh, when I first heard him as a comedian and on records before I got to know him, this aspect of what he had to say impressed me. His attempts to point out the uh, deceit and hypocrisy existing in American life because people are very resistant to having their basic values or their basic way of life questioned, let alone threatened in any way. And this, I think, accounts for the harassment and uh, persecution which Lenny Bruce endured from society and some of its representatives. Other intellectuals, like sculptor Vito Polikas, unflinchingly endow Bruce with the qualities of a messiah. As recently as just as a matter of, of uh, two or three weeks before his death, uh, Lenny Bruce influenced my thinking tremendously. <laughs> I learned about myself. I learned about my own hypocrisy. I listened to him as a student. I listened to him as a great teacher. And then I've remarked over and over to my students throughout these years that there was really one great rabbi, one great teacher and look to him, he will be placed amongst the great thinkers of mankind. But, uh, you know, pay homage to him now, Lenny Bruce is really a rabbi. The closest Bruce ever came to representing the Almighty was once wearing the vestments of a priest and begging money for the benefit of a leper colony. His brief career in the church abruptly ended with an arrest for panhandling. Born Leonard Alfred Schneider, he spent much of his childhood accompanying his divorced mother, Sally Marr, around the fringes of big-time show business. 
She entered dance contests, worked split weeks in vaudeville, and enjoyed one brief moment of glory in a movie called Gold Diggers of 1933. Much of Lenny's education was acquired backstage in burlesque houses and waiting around casting offices. He never finished the fifth grade. Sue Horowitz worked as Lenny's secretary for the last hectic years of his life and knew both mother and son closely. When you got to know Sally, after you knew Lenny, you could understand a lot of Lenny more. You can you can really see where he got a lot of his ways from, you know. All these years I didn't realize it until I sat back and listened to Lenny on stage and I went back 20, 30 years when I used to talk to him when he was a little boy and all the things that he was saying were the things that I, that he was living with me, that he was absorbing, that he believed in. Now Lenny was very serious and was always a thinking, he was always thinking, he was a loner, I never could get him interested in sports. I was completely an extrovert, Lenny was completely an introvert. The collection of standard one-line jokes with which Lenny won an Arthur Godfrey Talent Scout show in 1945 caused little apprehension among the comics hanging out at Lindy's. Before long, he was reduced to emceeing burlesque shows and introducing a motley array of tassel twirlers. He married a headliner, stripper Honey Harlow, in 1951. The marriage lasted seven years. He started experimenting around with dope. It's, uh, it changes everything. You know, you would... You would um, do things where you ordinarily, that wouldn't even come in your mind to do it, you know. He just liked the feeling. I mean, he could stop it whenever he wanted to, and he didn't feel like guilty about it. What well, I did, and I couldn't make sense in my mind why that I, because I was always so sure that if I did want to stop, I could. Until the first time I tried to stop. It's like, the lady who's the alcoholic out right tomorrow, the little junkies, they go, I'll keep tomorrow. And it was the same thing with me. But tomorrow, it doesn't come. Please. Honey Harlow's liberal attitude towards extramarital uh, sex was an additional irritant. But I wanted Lenny, I never told him this, but I wanted him to tell me, you don't do those things, you know, you don't stay up six in the morning and drag home one of the musicians. <laughs> but, um, he said, yeah, well, okay, baby, no, it's fine. Didn't even complain if I made any noise when I came in or anything. And it, I, it seemed like, um, that I would just, I found that I was doing the stuff that I didn't even want to do just to see how far I could go. Just to see if, and it, and then he wasn't, he wasn't my idol anymore. Jojo DeMora, a loyal Bruce follower who later worked as his road manager, remembers Lenny after the marriage ended. He loved her so much. He had loved her with everything that a man could love with. When she left him, when it, when it was all over, when he decided in his mind that, man, there's, she's not, he's not going to make it with her anymore, it's all over. As far as he's concerned, now it's Lenny Bruce, strictly Lenny Bruce. He started to cook. His mind was working strictly funny, 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 funny. It was party time. Every night was party time. Uh, Honey Bruce eventually was sentenced to a term in a federal correctional institution. The care of her child, Kitty, was assigned to Lenny's up. mother. And uh, since the divorce, I saw a different Lenny. He went a different way completely. As soon as Honey put him down, then I saw a different man. He used to say, and now she is here, lovely lady, too bad she's diseased. This is how he started to introduce the strippers on stage, you know. I got custody of my kids, my wife's a tramp. What do you mean she's a tramp? Did she go in the woods and roast Mickey's? No, she sleeps with guys. Oh, that filthy thing. She does it in front of the kids. How about that? Would any of you ladies do it in front of your kid? That sort of bitterness eventually formed the framework of Bruce's incisive humor. By the time he began attracting attention at a smoky San Francisco nightclub in 1957, he had made a swift transition from stand-up, joke-telling comedian to a freewheeling, hard-hitting critic of contemporary manners and morals. His routines were totally improvised. No two of them were exactly alike. 
Like an evangelist, he harangued audiences about their own failings, and those who understood spread the word. Soon he was playing nightclubs like the posh Blue Angel in New York at a fee of $5,000 a week. A routine on one of the albums titled Religions Incorporated mercilessly assaulted the commercialism of big-time religion and chided the papacy for its failure to take a firm stand on integration. In the following years, the chasm between Christianity and churches became a recurring theme that some observers feel ultimately triggered Bruce's downfall. You too. What? I'm getting crucified today. Um, get my file down here. Okay, get ready, all you guys. You're all getting crucified in this cell. Look, I'm the good thief. I mean, if it checks. <laughs> Come on, you get ready. Getting crucified. <laughs> I'm not getting crucified. Get my file down here. I'm the good thief. I'm here for petty theft. You understand? Checks. I'm going to get crucified now. I don't know what the hell this guy's doing, but uh, it's good luck to him. Okay, now he sees it getting more ready, and they're moving him. Hey, mister, do me a favor. There's a mistake here. They think that I'm with you for some reason here. And Christ says, don't worry, you'll be with me. Come on with that. I'm not with you. <laughs> but tell him. Come on, it's no joke now. We're going up the hill here. He's praying, and everybody's praying, and pushing him. Like, Come on with it. Hey, get the public defender. Okay, now up on the cross. Hey, mister, please, before it's too late, do me a favor, okay? Tell him. He said, don't worry, you're with me. Stop saying that, will you? I'm not with you, okay? I mean, I'm with you, I like you, but they think I'm with you means that I'm with you. I conspired with you, I don't know. Look, don't be pushy. I like you, okay? I don't know what you're talking about. I woke up, all I know, I'm getting crucified. I'm here for checks. I can't get crucified. I'm being denied due process. I'm entitled to do my time for checks first. And I don't want to get crucified. I can't go now, okay? I'll meet you later. Come on, don't be pushy now, okay? That's all. He said to wonder about if the Messiah is going to come back. Quick flash, and says, the Pope is too much. It looks like the Birdman of Alcatraz and Eichmann could bind. He wavers. He's just, Ero, arriva, arriva. He's really cute, just a little bird. I wonder what was going on in his head there. Spellman looks like Shirley Temple. He's like, hmm. That's like I in trouble for New York. Hmm. Just saying that. <laughs> but a priest told me that. That's what brings me up. I said, Spellman, you mean Shirley Temple? <laughs> That's funny, Shirley Temple. That's good imagery. Right? Sympathizers, in retrospect, feel that Bruce went too far in his relentless strafing of the church. Before long, Lenny found himself making dramatic front page headlines rather than the predictable negative reviews lost in the theatrical pages. Within a relatively short period of time, he was arrested on narcotics violations in three major cities. Now, the similarity of charges, all of them eventually dismissed, made one wonder whether Bruce was being intentionally victimized. On October 5, 1962, police apprehended Lenny outside of a Van Nuys, California hobby shop. Evidence later presented by the state's expert medical witnesses contributed to his conviction. Following many appeals, Bruce was acquitted of being an addict. Dr. Joel Fort examined Lenny during the first trial and testified in his defense. He currently serves as director of the San Francisco Health Department Center for Special Problems, and at the time of his testimony was a United Nations consultant on drug abuse. was that he had been certified by two uh, Los Angeles County doctors as being a narcotic addict. And it was my judgment that he was not an addict and it was very clear-cut that he could not have been addicted during the period in question. The uh, needle marks and uh, some of the history that was being used in this determination was more consistent with his own story, which seems substantiated that he was a regular user of methamphetamine or methadrine, which he was taking on prescription. So I think with him, uh, drugs uh, became a kind of crutch in some respects to keep him going during periods of depression and, and uh, frustration or alienation. Since he was under such constant and regular harassment and persecution for his beliefs and statements, both as a comedian and in the courts, but I would say in any case drugs were secondary as they often are in people's lives. Where somebody is uh, non-conforming or rebellious or, uh, in a broader sense, questioning their society, they inevitably will become frustrated uh, at the lack 
of uh, progress they as individuals or the society as a whole is making in dealing with the uh, wrongs and ills. And one thing they customarily do is turn to so-called deviant behavior, which may be excessive use of drugs, it may be in the sexual sphere. Commenting on Lenny's use of drugs, San Francisco Deputy District Attorney Arthur Schaefer voices similar stage, understanding. do what he did on the stage. So I, I, I never really even thought of criticizing him in that, in that respect. Uh, even saying, don't be a damn fool, what are you taking drugs for? You're liable to get caught. What, what do you want to do that for? You've got more important things to do. Uh, that aspect of it never even entered my mind because uh, how could you ask a guy who's doing what he's doing uh, not to do the other things? It just didn't fit. A guy like this is a, a flashing spark in the ferment and then has to spark out. His well-publicized collisions with the law seriously hampered Lenny's opportunities to work. Sources of income evaporated when most nightclub owners refused to hire him or canceled existing contracts. Paul Krasner, editor of The Realist, recalls Lenny's resultant depression and increasing reliance upon drugs. And then when we get better, we talk about it, you know, and he say, you don't know what it's like, it's like kissing God, you know, taking certain drugs. And he would talk, we would be there later, and he would say, um, I know I may, uh, I'll die young. That's, that was the context that, look, I may die young, but it's like kissing God, you know, and so if it was, uh, so what he was saying that if he died young because of drugs, it would be worth it. Not that he really meant it, but it was just a temporary rationalization. Jojo DeMora witnessed some of Lenny's bleakest moods. He had always used methadone. That was one thing that he, no matter what he, else he had used, methadone was always there. He really was very lethargic. Without methadone, he really, uh, uh, he couldn't move. He really couldn't function. There was, the lethargy would just take over him completely. And uh, it wasn't that it was a okay, he dug what it did for him. Lenny didn't like to sleep. He felt that sleep was a, a complete waste of time. And all those sleeping hours, he could be working. Working on this, working on that, working on material, and just continuously working. If it was aspirin, you didn't tell him what it was, he'd take the aspirin, you know. As long as it was a pill, it was something some sort. But meanwhile, like, uh, he had his meth, which gave him everything he wanted. His biggest fear of all was to sit inside of a jail and not be able to get out. Because he had a lot of energy. Oh, yeah. A lot of energy. A lot, a lot, a lot of... And uh, the idea of being inside of a cell, him, not being able to get out, he had felt that he would flip out completely. If that ever happens, he just starts screaming. Dr. Joel Fort elaborated further on Lenny's frustrations. Well, I think he was a very unhappy human being. Uh, I would say he was uh, unhappy, uh, restless, often depressed. Uh, he himself at times would describe himself as a megalomaniac. Uh, and it would be very difficult for somebody to see the world as it really is without being to some extent unhappy, restless, and dissatisfied. Lenny's mother accompanied him on his visits to a parole officer following a Los Angeles County conviction for possessing narcotics. For the first time that I took him to his parole officer, he was so depressed, you know, he didn't want anyone else to take him, anyone else to know anything about it. He was so depressed when he got out of that car and he went upstairs. But both of us had the same thing going. Sally Marr had also helped raise Lenny's 11-year-old daughter, Kitty. The girlish blonde hair billowing over her shoulders disguised her remarkable maturity. ...saying how great he was and everything, son. Like, um, like some people just don't want to face what there is. They just want to be put on all the time and, uh, they just don't want to listen to anything else except what they think. And sometimes that can hurt you, you know. He just had talent, that's all. He just knew how to talk and make people laugh. Kitty's sorrow is reflected in her self-accompanied elegy, which father and daughter sung together a week before his death. I almost forgot it now. I'm all nervous. No, that's okay. You better turn that off. It's, 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 no, no. It's... Shadow hanging over
Uncle Donald on a vacation, you are sometimes vague. You were experimenting and playing doctor. Oh, oh, we just lost another deuce up on the tier. That was a little too much when we did the fag bit. The clustered tables at the Gate of Horn nightclub in Chicago were packed on the windy night of December 5th, 1962, with the usual variety of audience that Lenny Bruce attracted, a cross-section of believers and curiosity seekers. While Lenny clutched a microphone, delivering his customary savage commentary, two members of the Cook County Police Force appeared in the back of the rectangular-shaped room, ready to pounce on what they considered to be the first sign of indecency. Inspired by their presence, Bruce staged a spontaneous performance that lampooned many well-known misdeeds of the local gendarmes. <clears throat> okay. It's, it's the first time they made a bust right in an audience. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> I really did. Wake up quick. Out the back, Ray. This bricks move. Anything. It's super Jew. I'm <laughs> rolling joke. All right. Now, uh, okay, the whole place is blocked off. And, uh, all right. Oh, I knew that. I knew that. Yeah. All right. The patrons were standing on their feet. One of the officers climbed on the stage and told him to sit down before announcing, The show's over, ladies and gentlemen, and checking everyone's liquor identification cards. Bruce was arrested that night. Four months later, he was convicted in absentia of giving an obscene performance witnessed by a 16-year-old girl. The nightclub operator was forced out of business. Bruce was fined $1,000 and sentenced to a year in prison. But within that year, he was freed by the state Supreme Court. He celebrated by triumphantly recreating the Gate of Horn incident at later nightclub engagements. Many of Lenny's troubles stemmed from the rapid-fire manner in which he delivered his material. He talked so fast that all, most listeners, including jurors, heard were the obscenities. Few could comprehend what he really was saying, certainly not the police who kept a silent vigil in theaters and nightclubs, monitoring virtually every four-letter word he uttered. The first of his numerous obscenity arrests occurred in San Francisco, the city where he earned his initial plaudits years before. He was accused of using an offensive, hyphenated, ten-letter expression during an appearance at the jazz workshop. Deputy District Attorney Arthur Schaefer successfully prosecuted the case. Surprisingly, Schaefer's estimation of Bruce changed completely shortly after he won the conviction. Picking up a guy on Martha Street, you know, it's, it wasn't that type of case, you could see immediately that uh, that Lenny had a a message to convey and and was sincere and honest about it. Uh, and his message was, uh, I think, to expose and hold up a mirror to society so that they can they can really see themselves. And he and he used words as the weapons to hit him over the head with. Uh, as tools, uh, clearly not uh, for the purpose of entertaining. I mean, the word was uh, a hammer that you hit people over the head with to make them recognize uh, that they're being hypocritical in every phase of their life. The words are merely a means of conveying ideas. And What he was trying to get at was the significance of these ideas. That what kind of crap is it to be able to say sexual intercourse and not the other? All people use these words, uh, including the judge and the jury and everybody else. But you don't dare say that you use them. Do you share that recall with me? The first gig I ever worked up here is a place called Ann's 440 which was across the street. And I got a call, and I was working a burlesque gig with Paul Moore in the valley. That's the cat on the piano here, which is really strange seeing him after all these years. And working together, the guy says, there's a 
place in San Francisco, but uh, they've changed the policy. Well, what's the policy? Well, I'm not there anymore. That's the main thing. Well, what kind of a show is it, man? Well, you know... Well, no, I don't know, man. Like, uh, it sounds uh, kind of a weird show. Well, it's not a show that a bunch of that's so all. That's a damn fag show, and that's... Oh. Well, that is a pretty bizarre show. <laughs> I don't know what I could do in that kind of a show. <laughs> well, now it's we want you to change all that. Well, oh, I don't... That's a big gig. Uh, I can just tell him to stop doing Largely it. Largely on the basis of the preceding tape recording, the single judge hearing the case convicted Lenny early in 1962. A retrial suggested in part by Schaefer reversed the verdict. Paul Krasner, also the editor of Bruce's autobiography, How to Talk Dirty and Influence People, further explains Lenny's reasons for habitually employing controversial and language. And WAP. Yeah. And he would start off an act sometimes by saying those words over and over, and, uh, you know, over and over, kike, nigger, I see WAP, you know, as if he were dealing in cards. He'd say, oh, I'll take one nigger, two WAP, give me a spick there, and a sheeny over here. Yeah. And, and, and he would say them so many times until the audience would begin to um, realize that they were just words and that you had to, and that you had to go beyond words. Um. Off stage, Bruce's open relationship with his young daughter illustrated how the public concept of what is obscene clashed with his own um, views. I saw them taking a shower together and I said, well, he really believes what he's talking about because, uh, uh, you know, he has a father with a, I guess she was about uh, eight or nine years old then and he's taking a shower with her. And, uh, you know, hey, our bodies ain't dirty. On the other hand, he was staying at my home once, and my wife was breastfeeding our baby. And he kind of turned the other way. He was a little bit embarrassed. So he wasn't totally consistent. I want to help you if you have a dirty word problem. There are none. And I'll spell it out logically to you. Uh, two prepositions. Two is a preposition. Come is a verb. Two is a preposition. Come is a verb. Two is a preposition. Come is a verb. The verb intransitive. To come. To come. Now, if anyone in this room or the world finds those two words decadent, obscene, immoral, amoral, asexual, the words to come really make you feel uncomfortable. If you think I'm rank for saying it to you, you're the beholder gets rank for listening to it, you probably can't come. <laughs> Modernizing inadequate archaic laws regulating the definition of obscenity became Lenny's obsession. Like chessmen on death row looking for a loophole, he absorbed the contents of several hundred law books, searching for a way to set a precedent. He was compelled by a gnawing fear of being the first major entertainer to suffer the ignominy of an obscenity conviction. All of his finances were drained hiring the 21 different attorneys who represented him in his multiplying court battles. During one frantic period, he was simultaneously fighting two charges of narcotics possession and one each of obscenity and battery. According to Schaefer, the tactics Lenny employed to implement his laborious efforts See, ultimately proved his undoing. I feel Lenny was doing something which was very important and doing it very well. So well that it killed him, literally. Or so well that he was killed by it. But to shift, what he did was literally shift his weapons. And I think he began to get hung up on the very thing that he was basically criticizing when he began to delve so deeply into the law and the procedures and that is on the words and the and the uh, and the symbols rather than the meanings of them and uh, he was hanging himself on his own guitar I might say that this is uh, 
the mistake too many people make. As a lawyer, I, I shouldn't say it, but the place for social change is not in the courtroom. Literally. And he, he fell into that trap. Barricaded behind the walls of his Hollywood Hills home, Lenny still endlessly studied the penal codes and listened to tape recordings of his performances over and over again. His daughter describes his incredible dedication. Well, according to his work, all he could ever do was work. Yeah, and uh, the pleasure he had was uh, listening to tapes and things, and I never thought that would be much of a pleasure, but uh, it seemed like Just work and work and work and never get sleep. Or he just, uh, he just wanted to know what the, the facts were in court and uh, just what he did wrong, like if he could learn anything about law and everything so he could fight his next case better. I used to wonder, uh, why they were putting up such a fight against it. And finally I realized that, you know, nobody just thinks like him, you know. There's like 40,000 other people who disagree. I think that a man should have his own right to talk like he wants, you know, and not for the people to decide. But, uh, you know, just talk that way. Jojo DeMora recalled the debilitating aftermath of these marathon sessions. Now, when Lenny, was, Lenny used to stay up for anywhere from between two to three days, if you caught Lenny on the third day, forget about it. It was all over. It's a repeat. He repeat, repeat, repeat the same thing he just got through telling you. He'd repeat it. So when he listened to those tapes on those third days, he already put words in their mouths. Uh, he already heard what he wanted to hear. We got him. It was always we got him. Tell you how obsessed he got with uh, with obscenity. He got so obsessed with it that it became a way of life to him. Lenny's last secretary noted his daily routine. Going down to a typewriter and just sitting there all day. His big problem was that he didn't have the background, you know, the jet. Well, he never learned a comma. So for six months, he was so involved with commas, grammar, you wouldn't believe it. And seven... The celibate regimen began to take its toll. Lenny looked haggard, and there were deep black pouches beneath his watery eyes. His shaggy, unkempt beard would have been suitable for a Talmudic prophet. At rare professional engagements, he wore what he liked to call his Chinese rabbi suit, a long black alpaca coat that buttoned high on his neck. Inevitably, such performances degenerated largely into detailed recapitulations of his legal entanglements. Paul Krasner witnessed a number of these shows. Uh, the main area was that, um, um, partially because of all his problems with the law, he stopped reading uh, newspapers and magazines and books, as he had been doing. He stopped going outdoors from his hotel room or from his home. He stopped, um, uh, you know, he stopped, he limited his, he, he limited his environment. And because of this, when he performed, he, um, he had to resort a great deal to old bits. And because he was bored with them, because he had done them enough times, he would mumble through them. And uh, so as a craftsman, uh, he was being unfair to the audience because he knew what was coming. And so many times uh, I would laugh because I knew what he was saying. Right. But the audience wouldn't laugh only because they could not hear what he was saying because he was going through it so speedily because he wanted to get it over with. And... Um, uh, I said, hey, you know, remember you told me about how often a comedian should get laughs, and uh, I noticed you're not doing that now. And he's developed. I said, well, I'm changing. And I said, what do you mean? And he really, you know, stopped and thought for a while. I said, I'm not a comedian. I'm Lenny Bruce. The problem I had a long time with understanding the law is because of the language in the law and the fact that instead of taking each word and finding out the case that the word related to, once when I get lazy and I would apply common sense. <laughs> and then I got really screwed up. Yeah. And this, it's really weird, like I went to the Supreme Court three times trying to get a writ of mandamus and kept sending it back to the clerk and he keeps saying, what the language said, append a copy of the order in respect of which the writ is sought. 
And I keep sending this copy of the lower court. They keep sending me back. We told you send the copy in respect of which the writ is sought. Then I dug, in respect of which, they use the word of like I use the word to. And respect of means this kind of respect. In respect of it. So what they want the Supreme Court is we want our judgment that these cats should respect us. Now the Supreme Court... On October 14, 1965, Lenny files suit as a pauper in a United States District Court, at the same time pleading for an injunction against the police harassment which he felt had cost him his livelihood. He had not worked in two months. Sympathizing with Lenny's insolvency, his probation officer handed him a $10 bill at the conclusion of their last meeting. John Judnick, a 28-year-old sound systems technician who occupied one of the bedrooms in Bruce's split-level home, recalled an alarming change in his appearance. He's on like 60 pounds. He said, I'm getting, getting crazy now. I'm going to go upstairs. He was getting crazy. He was just typing like one word on a piece of paper and throw the paper away. And the floor was just piles of paper, yeah. And just, uh, nothing, uh, it couldn't, uh, um, wow. Uh, never get every, all the facts together. Correlate. You never, yeah. never could, uh, wow. God, man, this is terrible. This is <laughs> wow. Really good. He burned, he burned it out, like, in five years. Yeah. It was Judnick who discovered the body at 6.15 p.m. on August 3rd, 1966. Well, it's, uh, I opened it, and then it was on the floor. I reached in, you know, I picked him, tried to pick him up, and both fell backwards into the pantry by the sink. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was slippery, yeah. But he was, he was, he was cold or anything. Oh, when I first saw him, I, th I didn't know, you know. I just grabbed him. And, uh, yeah. And his, and his spike was in his right arm. It's still there. It was just all the way, you know, plunged. The tie, he had a tie. It was just draped over his arm, and I picked it. It was just, like, yeah, around, yeah. and... And I just just pulled one in and picked it, and it dropped it. There's a little bit of blood in his arm. I just wiped it off, you know, the water, you know, put the spike in the sink. A week or so uh, before he was taught, he was reading books, uh, you know, things about death, and yeah. he could see no hope for anybody or anything in the way things are going it's the country the world Boy, found out. lenny bruce was dead at 40. You know, symbolically crucified by his own hypodermic so needle he had been preparing for a trip to new york where he would appeal an obscenity conviction and a lengthy jail sentence for delivering what was termed an obscene indecent immoral and impure monologue in a greenwich village cafe he was also contemplating his california possession of narcotics conviction planning an appeal based on a constitutional amendment designating the right of search and seizure. Jojo describes his arrival at the death site. Well, his last words that were written on a typewriter. I think that maybe he could have had a spoon of shit. And he went to the bathroom, he took off, came out, came back to his typewriter, started thinking, and started typing. He typed out, I think, see five or six words, uh, Conspiracy to interfere with the Fourth Amendment constitutes. It never finished the word constitute. It was C-O-N-S-T and it ended. I think when he got to that point, he that's what happened. He just went back in there and used the rest and fell over and that was... Lenny left his meager estate to his mother. Little more than the potentially valuable tape recordings of his performances made during the previous seven months. His legacy to society was far more substantial. In the end, his self-sacrifice had opened doors for others to freely communicate whatever sentiments that might move them, no matter how offensive or inflammatory. His mother selected an Orthodox Jewish funeral service for her late son, an astonishing decision, totally alien to the intransigent attitude towards organized religion that Lenny had embraced while he was alive. 
The majority of his friends avoided the hypocritical ceremonies. Instead, they later visited his grave. Many of them noticed the final irony. The marker embedded in the grass read, Leonard Scheider, August 1966. It was misspelled. S-C-H-E-I-D-E-R. I've lost a friend and I don't know why But never again will we get together to die And why after every last shot was there always another? Why, after all you hadn't got, did you leave your life to your mother? Honey Hollow The singer burlesque queen How did she know You needed more things Why didn't you listen to of your friends while they told you so I know you couldn't listen to people talk about what they didn't know 